Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. Well, I'm back with another astrophotography target tips video after doing a couple of equipment reviews. Hopefully you checked out my last video on uh, portable power solutions for astrophotography because it definitely will be helpful, especially for those of you that are new to the hobby. But back to my astrophotography target tips. And today we're going to be talking about a really cool target, M1, the very first target in the Messier catalog, also known as the Crab Nebula. This is a big, well, I'm not going to say big, but it's a beautiful, fairly bright, super Roman, supernova remnant uh, target, basically a star that exploded. And what's really cool about this target is that, you know, all these targets, many of them exploded or appeared, you know, way before uh, mankind was ever able to uh, observe them. But this one, we actually have historical evidence of when it was visible, first visible in the skies, and that's around 1054 AD. Pretty hard to imagine. Astronomers actually noticed this bright light in the sky. In fact, it was so bright that it was even visible during the day. Can you imagine what that must have been like? So amazing to have a target like this where we actually have historical evidence of when it first appeared, at least at least when the light first hit us here on Earth. So pretty amazing. Now, of course, we can't see it with our naked eye. It is fairly small. So I just want to say right off the top, you're going to need some focal length for this particular one as per the title of this video. So if you're shooting right now with a camera lens or, <clears throat> you know, a uh, a uh, red cat, you know, as I talk about many times, or even my sharp star 76 millimeter, this isn't gonna be a target that you're probably gonna wanna go after just yet. But anyway, I hope you find this video interesting. We're gonna talk all about the Crab Nebula, of course, where to locate it, integration time, and a little bit of processing as well. So let's talk about the Crab Nebula. So first of all, where is it located? Well, it's located in the constellation Taurus. Now, Taurus comes up in the eastern skies, usually late fall, uh, beginning of winter. And it's not one of those constellations that's immediately recognizable, this, this formation of the stars. Some of them are quite faint, at least in my Bordeaux eight and a half-ish skies here in Toronto. So in that, in that sense, it's a little bit challenging. Now, listen, I'm not going to pretend that I found this on my own as some of the other targets. As you guys know, I've been using my Optron mount. It has go-to capabilities, and so I'm not even gonna pretend like I found it, but I'm gonna try to help you find it if you uh, don't have that and you're trying to find it with, say, a star tracker. So again, Constellation Taurus. There are some bright stars in it. The center one is one of the brightest. It's called Aldebaran, I think. Aldebaran, something like that. Hopefully you can see in these images here. So Taurus is sort of that center, and then it goes, it's sort of, branches off in both directions. Now on the far right, top right, you have the star cluster Pleiades. That's one of the easiest things to find in the night sky. It's invisible, the worst of the worst skies. It's big, it's bright. And if you know where you're looking and you're looking in the Eastern sky, you should be able to find it within a couple of minutes at the very most. It's super easy to find. So that really helps. Now, if we take, go to the center, find Aldebaran, which you should be able to see even in the worst of skies. Then we go down to the left and that's where it's located. Now on that left side is a star called Elnath. And Elnath is actually part of, at least according to Stellarium, the constellation Auriga. And that's very easy to see, even in, again, even in the worst of skies. I talked about that in my Flaming Star uh, video. I talked about it in my Tadpoles. Those are all within Auriga. And the nice thing is Auriga, as I mentioned, is so easy to find. So you can, there's a number of ways that you can approach this. I think I would do find Auriga, then that bottom right star, Elnath, Below that is the star called Zeta Tauri, and that's the closest star to the Crab Nebula. Now you're gonna to need to use a, uh, uh, an app like Stellarium to help you find exactly where, you know, whatever time of year you're looking at, what formation they're in, and that, uh, that app will help you to recognize in your own night sky what you're looking at, and to identify those stars, Elnath and Zeta Tauri, and then in turn to find out where the Crab Nebula is. As I mentioned, it's small. And on Stellarium, it actually appears smaller than some of those stars. So that's why you're going to need some serious focal length to go after this target and uh, and have success in doing so. So hopefully that helps. Again, Constellation Taurus on the left side. Look for the star Elna that's in Auriga. And then underneath or beside, depending on the formation of the constellations, is that star Zeta Tauri. And the Crab Nebula is very close to that. Not going to lie, it's... It's going to be a challenge because, as I mentioned, you're going to be using some pretty serious focal lengths, so you're not looking at a huge amount of the sky. So you're going to be very patient and just make minor adjustments and keep checking for it. It's a magnitude 8.4, so 
not crazy bright, but not dim at all. You know, again, we reference it to something like North America, which is a six. A lot of targets in the summer skies are six, which are very bright. You can easily see them in a 30 second exposure. Um, this is an 8.4, so not too bad at all. You should be able to see it um, again with a 30 to second to one minute exposure. You should be able to identify it, but um, take your time. Give yourself time. You're going to need it probably to find this manually. It will be a little bit trickier than some of those big, bright summer nebula. So framing, not too much to talk about. Again, it's small. You just want to get it centered. What I will say with framing, though, is you're going to want to really take your time with your balancing your mount, your polar alignment, and your tracking. Because if you're going to be more zoomed in with focal length, you're going to see... Um, stars more zoomed in and you're going to notice when they're not quite round say your tracking isn't the greatest for whatever reason you're going to notice it more in a case like this so really concentrate on that get your setup just right take the time to do that and then you'll be a lot happier with the stars that you see in your image alongside the crab nebula so integration time well first of all let me show you a single exposure this is a single three minute exposure using my optron cem40 using my explore scientific 127 ed Okay, that's my biggest refractor that I have. And using uh, my ASI 533 MC Pro. Now, I was pretty blown away by this single exposure. I did not expect to see that detail. I did not expect to see that color. Having said that, I need to mention something, okay? I've never actually talked about this filter that I was using for this target. I've referenced it in one of my other videos and I wanna do a video on it, but I feel it wouldn't be right to pretend like everyone's going to see this, even if you're using just a, a light suppression filter and, you know, a astro modified DSLR. This is called the, if you haven't heard of it before, the Radian Triad Ultra uh, filter. It's a quad band. It's probably the best narrow band filter on the market. And it's expensive, not going to lie. It's worth every penny, and I'll talk about that in a, in a later video, but I need to mention, I want to be honest with you guys, that has a lot to do with um, you know, the quality of a single exposure. Even though it's three minutes, uh, you may not see quite that much, but nonetheless, you should still be able to e easily identify this particular target because it is so unique. Uh, but I wanted to mention that. So the refractor that I use there that explores scientific 127 with the 0.7 reducer has a focal length of about 667 millimeters. So it's a good amount. It's not crazy, but it's definitely a good amount of focal length. So I would say you could probably get away with a little bit less. Um, maybe something like my uh, ED100. I've talked about that telescope. I've made a video on it. You could probably shoot image this target with that. It's going to be smaller and you're going to see less detail, of course. But I would say you could probably get away with it and do a large crop. But anything under that, I don't know if I personally would try. I mean, if you're okay with just seeing a very small dot or you're trying to shoot it with something else in the, you know, in the frame field of view, then of course go for it. But if you're trying to get lots of detail and really do this target justice, you're going to need at least, I would say, 500 millimeters of folk length, give or take. So there's my single exposure. Now, total time was five hour, five and a half hours, which isn't a ton of time. But based on what I saw in that single exposure, I figured it would be enough, and it was. As a, as a, just for fun, I, I, um, I decided to process my single exposure, and I gotta say, it's not bad. <laughs> here it is here. Um, so you know, that's based on being so blown away by that single exposure. But obviously, not as good as my final uh, image. But it just goes to show, like, if you have the right equipment and you know the right filter for your sky conditions. You don't always need to sync a ton of integration time. Uh, but again, that depends on the target. So I would say based on that, anywhere around two to three hours should get you a pretty decent image. If you want to go even more, like I did five, I mean, if you want to go to 10, you'll, you'll probably get even more detail. You get a, a little bit more of that glowing gas around it. But if you're limited on time and uh, clear nights, anywhere from two to five hours should get you a really nice image. Let's talk about processing. You know, this is one of those targets where when I first saw it, I thought, man, I wonder, I bet you that's a tricky target to process. But I have to say, it really wasn't. Again, I need to go back to this filter because this filter makes processing a lot easier. So keep that in mind. If you're shooting, again, with a light suppressant, just a light suppressant filter and, you know, a DSLR, you may have a little bit more of a challenge. But with this filter, boy, processing was actually quite easy. The biggest thing I would say is, as always, trying to get your background nice and uh, smooth and consistent 
and then focusing on the crab nebula itself. So basically what I did was I lassoed off the crab nebula itself and then I selected inverse on uh, Photoshop. So by doing that now we're we're isolating the crab nebula and we're only working on the background. So I, you know, played with exposure, brought it down a little, um, dark points, sh uh, shadows, all that just to get it consistent while trying to maintain some natural star color because it's always nice when you can get some blue and orange stars in an image, particularly when you're really zoomed in, you notice them even more. Then when I was happy with that, I uh, unchecked inverse. So now we're working on just the crab nebula itself. And really all I did for the most part was camera raw filter and worked on things like um, the texture, slider, um, brightness, highlights, stuff like that, just to sort of bring out the detail. Uh, the one thing I will say is when you first take your stacked image and you start to stretch and all that, it does pop out fairly quick, but it does look a little bit, let's say soft, not blurry is not the right word, but not a lot of detail. You can definitely see the shape of it. You can see those filaments of gas inside but it's not very crisp. Well, the, the goal was to bring out as much of that detail as possible. I, if I'm being honest, I probably overdid it a little bit, but I'm still happy with the final result. So that was the main thing. Now, I wanna also mention one of the things I used was something called shake reduction. I've talked about this before in Photoshop. It's under the sharpening tab at the top and, um, or say, say filter, then sharpen, and then in the sub menu, the shape reduction. I've used this shake reduction. I've used this for on quite a few targets. And I've talked about before, you gotta be careful. You don't wanna overdo it, but you gotta, it takes some time and play with it. Play with the sliders, how aggressive it is, and see what works. But even just a little bit of that shake reduction, just really crisp it up nicely, that the rest I could play with uh, with just the uh, texture tab in, in camera filter. So that shake reduction was definitely important. I did find it made a, a big difference and it helped give bring out a lot of those details. Otherwise, you know, I, I have to say it's a unique target because the, the colors, the green, the sort of pink, blue, they just sort of appeared naturally as I, as I you know, uh, stretched the image and just played with the color balance a little bit. I didn't have, there's no areas in this image where I was like isolating by lassoing off certain areas and trying to bring them out. I just sort of play with it as a whole. And that's very rare. I would say, you know, 80%, 90% of the targets I, I process, I do use that lasso tool to um, single off certain areas and play with them, try to bring them out. But in this case, I just worked on it as a whole. And that's why I love this target. All those beautiful bright colors, they almost look neon. And it's quite unique compared to many other targets out there that are mostly red and, you know, something I've talked about many times. So that's why I wanted to go after this one. This, this was one that was definitely on my list. And I'm so glad that I was able to image it. And I hope that you guys are too. I hope this helps. Again, your biggest challenge is probably going to be finding it if you're not using a go-to mount. And just, you know, having the right equipment, um, the right focal length to be able to do it justice, to get as big as possible in a single frame. And once you're able to do that, you have the equipment to do that, the processing is actually quite easy. So um, that's always nice. You don't have to spend likely hours and hours processing it to really do it justice. So I hope that helps guys. It's an amazing target. If you've, if you've never done it before and you have the right equipment, I really highly suggest you go after M1. It's such a beautiful and unique target. And again, the history of it and knowing that people were able to see it with their naked eyes, even during the day, just makes it all the more cool and a really special target. So hope you enjoyed this video. Tried to keep this one shorter, but I look forward to sharing more with you. I got a couple more images that I've already processed and I can't wait to share those videos with you as well. But thanks so much guys. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. I've got a lot more to come. Some more equipment reviews coming your way as well this spring. So I look forward to that. But until the next one, take care. See you on the next one.